Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and I'm now joined in the studio by JJ Bull the Bullet. Hello, JJ. Hello. How are you? Wonderful. Fantastic. How are you? I'm fine. All the better because through the internet we are joined by, hmm, guten tag, Herr Staffelblor, Vic H. Stu. Hello, Joe Devine. How are you? I'm fine. As I already said, today we're be gonna talk about uh, slightly better for talking mm, to me. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. How are you, Seb? Yeah, I'm really well. Great. Really well. Are yeah. you? How are you, Joe? Oh yeah, everyone's fine. Everything's good here. I'm fine. Yeah. Things are dropping off a little. Less good than I was two minutes ago. We're going to talk about the football today. Manchester United, uh, Manchester City, of course, the big Manchester derby. How many times will we say Manchester today? I expect several. Uh, also, West Ham beating Liverpool. What an interesting one. Lots of managers have been fired, so we'll get to that. And, of course, there are you know new arrivals, including Antonio Conte. We'll speak a little bit about him later. Um, of course, the biggest news uh, from the weekend's football, JJ. Don't know if you saw this, but, of course, uh, there was a match between Waterford and Shamrock Rovers in Ireland that was suspended due to fireworks being detonated in the stands and on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not funny because it was dangerous. But fireworks were literally exploding in like in a very dangerous proximity to the football players who were kind of running away, understandably running away from the pirate technics. The pirate techniques. The pirate techniques <laughs> exploding so in their faces. Pirates let fireworks off in a pitch. So, you know, I feel sorry for those feel sorry for those uh, footballers. And also, it's quite funny because you can see, you know how some fireworks, you light the firework mm. and then it sort of shoots out lots of fireworks, but in in bits. So, you know, you, it will have a delayed reaction. You'll have like five fireworks in one tube. Do you know what I'm saying? How uh, much noise do those ones make? No, I'm just saying one that will, you, you light it and then it'll go toot, toot. Like a, like a Catherine wheel. Like they'll just keep, no, not like a Catherine. Oh, yeah, it's, like it's, a, it's more like of a pop a, noise and then it comes out. Not the pop, not the noise. What no? I'm saying is you get five fireworks out of one firework. That's what I'm saying, right? So imagine this, the person in the stands who thought this was a good idea to light it. The first one goes off, bad idea, but they can't stop it. <laughs> so there's four or five more which go off over the course of the next 15 seconds. Everyone's panicking, you know. Sounds great. I mean, five fireworks in one sounds like good value for money. I think it probably is. Much like The Athletic. Oh, what a bang that was, eh? Visit theathletic.com forward slash TIFO to find a 30-day free trial and all the fireworks you could ever dream of. Fireworks metaphorically, of course, in the form of explosive writing <laughs> and um, colourful uh, features and loud news. Yeah? You'll be craning your neck for days. Theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Yes, now anyway, uh, that'll do for our intro, won't it? Other than to say, do buy the Tifo merch. If you're out with the fireworks, uh, you'll want to be warm. So wear a T-shirt that has Tifo on it. It won't keep you warm, but it will make you look buff. Also, if you want to get something in before Christmas, Xmas, holiday period, uh, 25th of December, if you want to do that, you really should be buying it now because of uh, delivery times. Anyway... Uh, I will now leave you in the uh, the warm hands and the oh so cool embrace of uh, football. Yes, let's begin with Manchester United nil to Manchester City. Uh, now, Seb, uh, the thing I found interesting about this was uh, Guardiola explained after the game about City's focus on ball retention. Uh, incidentally, they had uh, nearly sixty eight percent possession in this game. Um, he explained that this was intended to combat United's ability to counterattack, which didn't really seem like an ability during the game, uh, but it might explain why City shut the game down at 2-0. They were, of course, entirely dominant. And although this scoreline included fewer goals than the Liverpool game from a couple of weeks ago, the manner of the defeat was largely as comprehensive as that game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite emasculating as a performance. It was sort of, I suppose, figurative equivalent of um, a playground bully holding a younger child at bay. Um, sure. Because City were in complete control. Guardiola did that weird thing that he has in his repertoire where he wins, he beats a team, and then he kind of goes overboard with uh, with his praise for them. I think we remember sort of him, him describing Maurizio Sarri's Napoli as the best team he's ever faced. Sure. Which was never good, but, you know. Um, and he had a little bit of a, a strange quotation about 
well, we know they're so, so dangerous. And it, it made it sound as if um, Manchester United were about to kind of spring forward at any opportunity and could capitalise even on the, the smallest mistakes. And that's not really the Manchester United we've seen for quite a while. Yeah, they can counterattack. They've got a little bit of pace. They've got, um, you know, there there is a threat, but I don't think, um, well, I mean, there wasn't many sort of joined up parts of Man United's game over the weekend. It's, it's funny though, because he, he does this. It's like a... It seems too simple a diagnosis to say he does it to kind of flatter the, the performance of his own team. But it does seem like that a little bit. Like he, you remember the, the Nathan Redman incident after a game against Southampton? And when he talked about, I don't know, when he was in, when he was Bayern Munich head coach, he talked about, you know, maybe wanting to play with a thousand Dantes at centre half or something. Sure. It's very yeah. strange. It's yeah. very, very strange. It is I don't strange. know if it's a lost in translation thing. I'm not sure. It might but be. It's, it's um, hard to be yeah. a gracious winner. I mean, you wouldn't yeah. know much about that, but I, just from no. experience, it is, it's difficult to be gracious as a winner, isn't it, JJ? And let's explain it to Seb. To be gracious in winning? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to really how to hmm, talk one thing. <laughs> <But> also, <laughs> now I've regained the ability to talk. Gracious winning. I don't know how to well, expand on that. What I'm saying that. is that if you win something and mm. then you're talking to your opponent or your competitor afterwards and you say something like, oh, you were great. You know, it's like when someone at the Oscars wins the Oscar and they go up there and they say, oh, and I want to say to, 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 you know, my fellow nominees for this award, weren't they all fantastic? In my mind, I'm thinking, well, they weren't as fantastic as you, though, were they? And, because you've won the award. It's, it, it's a difficult balance to strike. Maybe that's what it is, Seb. Yeah, it's a fine line because when you, yes, it's customary, okay, you go up to, to receive your award at the Oscars and you congratulate all the people in your category. But then that's usually one line. If you add a couple more sentences in, like if you start talking about, oh, you know, your method acting was terrific and I really like the score in your film and you just go a little bit above and beyond, all of a sudden it does sound like you're trying to flatter yourself a bit too much. So maybe, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's you, a very, very strange habit. Yeah. So I'm laughing at JJ's really bad attempt to answer the question. But let's move on to JJ. Let me ask you something you might be able to answer the question to, which was... <laughs> um, still, still appears to be no indication that Solskjaer will be, will be let go. Are you surprised by this? Uh, well, there's no one really available to come in. <laughs> as one problem. There's not really available that they want in. Uh, he's not done a bad job. He might still achieve their ambition of qualifying for the Champions League. So from a business point of view, which is I think most of the people upstairs at the club run it as mm. and have done for a long time, yeah. he's actually probably meeting his expectations yeah. despite them being awful. Was it their one win in the Champions League away from definitely qualifying, aren't they? Or potentially exactly. Group, yeah. And they've got good players and it could just be they're in a bad patch just now. I mean, they have been good at times on the social sure. The difference we see is that there's no clear, he's not too cool, he's not Klopp, there's not a clear style of play that's definitely working. It's most yeah. into individuals. There seems to be a lot of noises coming out now about l lack of direction and training yeah. and coaching, which is a potentially a problem for them. Is it fair to say though that it was clearer before, I, I, and again, not to lay everything at the door of Cristiano Ronaldo, that's not my intention, but... Um, it seemed that in previous seasons, uh, Manchester United under Solskjaer, the, there was no real clarity of identity beyond the idea that they could counter-attack well, that they had fast players up front, and that the individual ability of those players often led to Manchester United scoring more goals than the opposition that they were well, facing. Right? But now it seems before. to be more complicated uh, because the style of play has, I suppose, attempted to be changed to fit around Ronaldo. Um, potentially, I think the biggest change is that everything was built around Bruno Fernandes before. Yeah. Everything. So he was the star, everything was built around him and he was able to make that work for them. Mm -hmm. But been but taking different players in like Ronaldo and trying to fit everyone in the same system, Sancho's another example, uh, it hasn't worked for Fernandes who is now nowhere near as involved with everything as he used to be. Yeah, He's more, I mean, You could say that's probably better going forward strategy wise because you're not relying on one player. So if he gets injured or kidnapped or something. Sure. I don't know why that would happen to him. But that sounds it, like I know. It could, ha it could happen to anyone, <laughs> could I happen, should say. It could happen to you. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, uh, Bruno Fernandes was at the centre of everything. Now they're trying to put less uh, reliance on him. So if something does go wrong, they don't have to only have that. But like you're playing against City, you had Greenwood and Ronaldo kind of meant to be your front two. Yeah. It worked, I think, when they had Ronaldo and Cavani and they've played that in the, the back three because Cavani's pressing numbers are amazing. Greenwood we've talked about before, doesn't seem to yet have had the coaching or know exactly when and where to press. Yes. So him and Ronaldo essentially rules out two players from that thing. 
And then you've got what's meant to be a back three was very much a back five. And the way City played kept them held back in that game. So it, that system didn't work at all against a good team. It worked against a bad team, but any system of Man United should work against a bad team because mm. they have good players. Sure. But this is the thing. Do you want to build it all around Fernandes and let him be the penalty taker, the free kick taker, the the only guy who puts yeah. through balls in? And then you can sit back and in a different way and try and counter attack. It seems to be the best way they're set up, but the, the way they built their squad doesn't really suit any particular style of play and Solskjaer's struggling to get everyone on the same team. Yeah, it was interesting on Saturday. I was I was uh, talking to um, a friend of mine, uh, Paul Ansorge, um, uh, of uh, of no question about that. The, the the good Manchester United podcast. We were chatting last night, and he said that he one of the things he'd enjoyed watching the most about that game, enjoyed loosely, of course, uh, was uh, Greenwood's attempts to uh, man mark um, uh, Rodri uh, in you know the, the deep area of Manchester City's midfield. It wasn't clear whether he'd been asked to do that or not. I assume he had it wasn't very successful. And again, another sort of indication of it, it what's happening on the pitch, Seb, seeming to be slightly uh, different to uh, perhaps what uh, they're being asked to do or the, you know, again, the clarity of the coaching is confusing. Yeah, I, I think it must be the clarity issue, Joe, because one of the things that strikes me and that this is, this is related to that agreement point is that there are never, there are never any repetitions in May United's possession phases. Like a lot of teams... <clears throat> Had these little sort of um, structures built into their, their open plays. So, for instance, you saw Man City's quick switch quite a couple of times at Old Trafford, where they you know build a little bit of a phase on one side of the pitch and then quickly switch to the other side. And um, I know that sometimes coaches get criticised for being a little bit mechanical, but it feels also as if when teams are struggling a, b- a little bit, that's quite a nice thing to 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 have in your repertoire because it, yeah. it can provide some stability. If you're lacking confidence, you can just default back into your into your system. And main, no, no main United phase ever seems to be the same as the next. And I, I think we talked do, about do this on think, WhatsApp. Do you think, though, it's possible, Seb, that... Do, I don't know if you remember, but when uh, Jose Mourinho was just leaving Manchester United, there was a real toxicity around the whole scenario. The fan base were very unhappy with him. And obviously you have this club legend come in who wins the first four games in a row. The, the sort of dominant narrative at the time was he's unshackled the attack, right? He just let them go. And these perceived patterns or, or faces of players you're describing now that were attempted under Jose Mourinho that just weren't working, um, they were dispelled. And all of a sudden Man United were fluid in attack and the players were, were rushing forwards with the ball in a way that, uh, you know, it felt like they'd been held back from doing for a while. It's, it's easy to sort of get caught in that, place isn't it because it was a it was a good time for the fans it feels like that kind of situation is a a little bit of a spectrum so you you go from one side where everything at least without the ball is hyper rigid um under someone like Mourinho and also the kind of the off the field stuff is a little bit tense too then you release the pressure valve by bringing in a soft jar type and then over time you gradually slide from left to right and beyond a certain point it's not healthy anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's my kind of layman take on it. I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's any more complicated than I'm just not sure Man United's coaching is very good. Sure. Um, it on just seems... Hand, Manchester City's coaching looks very, very good. They, I thought it was their, one of their finest performances of the season, JJ. They were extremely comprehensively good. Yeah. Was it Gary Neville said they silently annihilated them? Yeah. It, yeah, it, it, it had that feeling, didn't it? I think they they had 2-0 and didn't need to do anything else. They, they just, just kept the ball. Yeah, to suffocate it. It just looks like watching the old Barcelona teams. Yeah. Just so, so much better. Yeah. Different level altogether. They were extremely so confident. And better coach, yeah. It, it felt a little bit, though, to me, like watching Manchester United against Spurs the previous weekend. It's very hard to gauge... Uh, I think it's a common thing you might hear a match of the day, but were Man City good? Were Man United bad? It's it's a difficult one to know if we're trying to place Man City in terms of the finishing positions this season. We watched Liverpool lose at the weekend as well. We'll come and talk about that. But, um, you know, they're still up there with Liverpool, right? Yeah, you can see Man United are not at the same level as City. They're just, yeah, they are a much, much better team. But equally, United did create a couple of chances that they could, in mm-hmm. another day, you could have had, say City didn't take their chances, which they've done before, well, one of them, one of which was an own goal, and the second was a, a goalkeeping error. Like there was, a, yeah. there's a scenario that the obvious issue with this is that Man City, as soon as they got to two nil, they stopped trying to score, <laughs> which is a very reasonable <laughs> approach. Uh, so you don't know whether they would have created more chances or not. But you know, those two goals, they were low chance goals. And quite, I think I agree with Guardiola on that. They are actually dangerous. United on the the counter, especially because they have these players that can do. But you saw the, if you look at the average positions map, I think I tweeted one um, from some point during the game. United looked like a one nine sure. zero formation because yeah. the way City kept them 
pressed in. They couldn't get anywhere near it. Lindelof's average touches were as near his own penalty box. Yeah. Uh, nothing like what United should have been like. But, I mean, they're not playing very well at the moment. And I, what Seb's saying about the individualistic part of it is part of what makes them good in counterattacks. There's no set place. You don't know exactly how to to train against them during the week because they could yeah. do any number of different things. Seb, uh, Chelsea top the league, I think, at the moment. Uh, Liverpool second going into the um, international break. We certainly shouldn't write Man City off, though, should we? No, no, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I I thought they were really interesting parts of their game. I think we, we talked to, on Saturday about like Kevin De Bruyne's positioning. Uh, De Bruyne, I don't think De Bruyne is having a particularly good season, but he, he popped up in some unusual positions on the pitch. He was very, very deep. He was almost he was almost dropping between his centre half the points during the cent during the um uh during the first half. Which is an interesting tweak because if you're facing a team who um have structural issues and don't have a lot of discipline and are really, really struggling for stability in the middle of the pitch, the, probably the last thing you want to face is a player of De Bruyne's quality dropping deep and just moving to wherever he wants to receive the ball. Um, so that was quite interesting. I feel there's still a lot more to come from uh, Phil Foden as a Premier League player, just because it was still in that sort of finding out stage with him. Well, he was chosen and over when, Grealish on the left-hand side as well, wasn't he? Which was, which was interesting. A bit of a return to the uh, orthodox wingers era. Yeah, maybe also a little bit of a, a need for something a bit more direct. Maybe I think sometimes Grealish can... No, it's not intended as a criticism, but Grealish can slow the play down a little bit because when the ball's at his feet, he's kind of, um, he's always looking for a final ball. Whereas I think Foden is someone who, Foden's a better player at taking on a player, at taking on a defender. Yeah. He's kind of, he creates more fractures. And so, I mean, not that they really um, needed to, I don't think, but JJ spoke about kind of their formation in the first half and how deep they were and um, how packed the defence were. Well, I think I want a Foden in there causing... Um, disruption to a kind of a, a packed back what are we calling it back 10 maybe sure uh, or nine and Ronaldo standing in the center circle um but it's no Man City looked very very good um a couple of issues with um with the defense because Man United didn't seem to have any kind of rhythm they didn't create anything they didn't have any sustained pressure and yet they did have a couple of chances and the defence, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. John Stones always makes me feel a little bit nervous. I don't know if that's fair. He feels like a, he feels like one of a number of um, of England players that have come back from the Euros and just, I don't know, not quite where they were. Anyone listening uh, to this, but there were a few comments uh, last week about uh, gas leaks in your homes. It's not a gas leak, don't worry. It's just that the heating is on now in this building and it's apparently the pipes... Really hiss. What you're saying is we built a studio in the absolute best place we could have done, beneath pipes. Central London. Yeah. Welcome to Central London, where everything's loud all the time. Anyway, ignore the hissing. It's not in your head or around you. Oh, big time. I can hear it now, and I'm not even in the is same room. Is that really message. scary yeah. electrical cupboard still yeah, sure. vibrating in the office? Anyway, let's move I on haven't, now haven't, and talk about been for a while. West Ham. Uh, three yeah, it's scary. to yeah. Liverpool. Uh, this was a fascinating uh, a, a affair, JJ. Uh, win takes West Ham above Liverpool into third place. Equal points with Manchester City after 11 games. What a stunning achievement, of course. What has David Moyes done to this team? They've scored more than Man City as well. Well, there you go. That makes them good. That's because Man City gets a two and then stop, but yeah. Yes. Um, Moyes has just got a really good set of players who work very hard in and out of possession. Uh, it's very, very well balanced. Good spine to the team. Um, but I think the key to it is lots of big lads. So you look at the players they had. So Ogbonna had to go off with injury at some point. So you had um, uh, Dawson come in, but uh, at the back you had uh, Dawson. Who was the other guy next to him? Zuma, mm. big lad. Mm. Um, in the midfield, you get Rice counts as a big lad. Socek's definitely a big lad. Antonio, big lad. And then surrounding the, the top part of the pitch, you've got Antonio, who is massive, but is also very mobile and agile and quick. Mm -hmm. Supported by technical players like Fornals and Bowen and uh, Benrama. So Fornals had a fantastic game. He's been really good this season and mm -hmm. all season. And then they, they don't mind their opposition team having possession because they just they, they get compact and then ready to, to hit. And then as soon as the ball turns over, you'll have uh, Bowen and... Ben Rama or Fornells will start breaking with Antonio, who yeah. acts as the kind of first ball out, the target man. And Rice can either carry it 50 yards, like Yaya Touré, yeah. or he can 
paying eight fifty. Yeah, like Yaya yeah. Touré, yeah. yeah. So he's becoming that sort of player. Which I think he's even spoke about trying to be that kind of box to box player this season. Yeah. And then they get in, they get out wide, put the ball into boxes, make a lot of crosses, just like United used to do under Moyes. And because they've got the big lads, either win the first ball and it's a shot, or they win the second, knock down, and they get a chance out of that. And then yeah. they just fall back and be compact. Their contract and expand thing was really it was very noticeable against Liverpool. It reminds me of uh, the the fa- fabulous uh, magical fight scene between <laughs> Dumbledore and Voldemort oh, in no. uh, Harry Potter, of course. Uh, there's a great bit where one the Voldemort, he brings in the magic in, <laughs> sucks it into a little bowl, a ball, and then <laughs> it expands. We've talked and, you know, about this. It's, it's with all the, Seb, the, West Ham are having a, 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 a lovely time of it right now. Do you think, as you said to me on, in text at the weekend, that they're going to win the league? Because you did say that. I, no, no, I didn't say that. But I, he did say I, that. I'm impressed. I, I think um, <laughs> we we had a few conversations about this game, and I, I found aspects of it really, really strange. Like there was um, the. It was a FIFA game. I remember now. It was a little bit. It was very, very back and forward. And some of the kind of I remember the um, the the four nails goal when yeah I think three or four the three or four Liverpool players just tracked Michel Antonio, and sure. you said to me, oh, you know, Liverpool defenders are absolutely petrified of Antonio and you're right and it, but it's a weird thing to happen to that defence and uh, well, in, that, in that specific goal yeah. was that when you, you said to me uh, oh this, this 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 looks like a FIFA goal and I was watching yeah. the replay at the time and you the reason I thought it looked like a FIFA goal was because uh, as you say there are three Liverpool players tracking Antonio and but then um, Matip just stands up like he just he takes a step yeah. forwards it, almost as if you know when you're playing FIFA and you the ball you accidentally your gets defender closer by to mistake. yeah and you select a different player and then it goes onto the defender and they step up the AI brings them forward and just leaves all the spaces behind that is exactly what that goal looked like like yeah, he was and being also, controlled remotely well there was an aspect of that to the um to the Kazuma header because mm-hmm. it's a very nice corner it's a nice routine everyone gets distracted by Thomas Suchek running um, from out to in but there's no response. Like uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold, presumably he's not detailed to be on the post, but he's he's kind of that's his zone. He's just and watching. Part, yeah, he it's just so but he doesn't weird. even move. Like I, I was, watched um, that three or four times, and I cannot really understand. Strange. At least run at it. You don't have. To, I'm not saying you'll beat Zuma to that ball, but he just stands there and watches it go in. You kind of move before you make that decision, though, because yeah. you it's not a it's not a driven ball. Doesn't arrive that quickly. It's a big loopy in swinger from the other from the other corner. And you have a little bit of time to adjust to it. And even even though Suchek moves, it's not Suchek isn't his responsibility. It's not a man marking system. It's not like nobody's blocked him off. He's got a clear view of what's happening. He's got a clear view of Zuma's run. It's just really strange. It's really odd to I think watch. West Ham will have looked at that and looked at they put Alexander Arnold as the far post zone. That's his. That's where he goes. So you won't try and isolate him. And you see the block that Rice puts on. I can't remember who, the guy who's trying to mark Zuma. I can't remember who it is. Basically, gets blocked by Rice. So Zuma comes around the back of them and sneaks into that bit. It's an easy corner routine. And then Alexander Arnold came out afterwards and said um, that they could tell that West Ham had been watching what they'd done at set pieces and had exploited it. So they need to work on that. Not, you know, admitting that <laughs> specifically him is who they were targeting mm. at the free kicks. Yeah. That's another thing that West Ham do very well. They score a lot of the goals from free kicks and corners. Set piece takers. Set pieces. They focus a lot of attention on that. Yeah. Well, they have good set piece takers, and they have good set piece headers of the ball. Yes. Yeah. Those things help. But how good would they be in a world without heading? Less. Let's have a break. Hello, I'm Ian McIntosh. I'm the Lord of the Games here at the Athletic. What's that? You didn't know that the Athletic had gaming coverage. God, we've got loads of it. And from today, you can follow it as if you're following any of the other hundreds and hundreds of teams that The Athletic covers. There's football manager stuff. There's stuff about FIFA. And there's our comprehensive fantasy Premier League coverage there too. Just look for the top of the screen, look for the little controller icon, and you can follow it right there. And if you haven't got a subscription to The Athletic already, what the hell's wrong with you? Go to theathletic.com forward slash gaming. Get one today. And we're back from the break. What a lovely break that was. Sackings now. Um, there have been two sackings since we last spoke. Well, I'm sure there have been more. But uh, specifically in football, there have been two sackings. Yeah, not at Tifo. <laughs> not at Tifo. <laughs> Although there will be one soon. Um, Dean Smith, uh, Aston Villa. I feel like we should talk about this. The second of the two. 
But let's begin with Dean Smith. Uh, Seb, five defeats in a row at Aston Villa. Lots of injuries, of course. We know that. Um, and we also know that he, w- he was liked by the players. This is a, a sort of sad situation. It's not one where fans and players are happy uh, to see Dean Smith go. Um, it wasn't quite working. Is this a knee-jerk decision? I think you can spin it either way, Joe. I think if you've watched Villa recently, they've been pretty poor. Although the second half against Southampton, they didn't look like a team that weren't really asked about whether their manager was going to be sacked or not. There no, was, um, yeah. They knocked on the door quite a lot and they, they didn't get a goal, but they played okay. Certainly in relation to how they've been playing over the past sort of six weeks. Um, I get it. I, 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 this is, I, I don't think you can lay this at Villa's door because this is football now. Like You have five bad results and the manager's job is under, at some under threat. Yeah, well, well at most clubs. Like, not especially, Man United. Not Man United, no. Though, strangely, he, he, he lives on. But um, I think it's extra sad because, obviously, if you remember what Villa Park used to look like when, and that's a five-year period under a succession of managers like Paul Lambert was there, uh, mm-hmm. Jared Julio was there for a little bit, um, Remy Gard was there. Yeah. During that sort of, um, during Randy Lerner's slow retreat from English football, out of English football, Villa Park was empty. And cool. it was... There was no aspiration. Everybody knew that the relegation was inevitable, if not this season, the next. And I think one of the things that Dean Smith has done so well is restore a lot of pride. It's quite a trite thing to say, but that. People people sure. want to go and watch Villa. Villa are a, a team worth watching now, again. Well, a cup um, final at Wembley, of course, and promotion to yeah. the Premier League. He was there for, for three years. Lost Grealish in the summer. That was never going to be easy, but... What is it specifically that's gone wrong this season, JJ? Because, uh, you know, the transfer window was really exciting. We made a video about it at the time. They brought in uh, several young, good players. Um, I was feeling very positive about them. Um, They're a sort of mid-table, either lower or higher side, depending on how they're playing at a particular time. Mm. That's how good their players are, and that's sort of where they are. He's just tried to transition... uh, to a couple of different systems now. He tried to put it back three in. He's played a four four two for a lot of it because he's got players that can do that. But they also lost their best player, Jack Grealish. Um, he was the best player by a mile from last season who was responsible for a lot of the goals they scored and the chances they created. Yeah. And surprisingly, now that they don't have him anymore, they're, they're worse off than they were. Well, also, it's not just that he was a good player, but presumably Villa's system was built around him last season. So now it's not only finding players to replace those goals and assists, but also tweaking the system so that it isn't, you know, built all around the, 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 so the left all forward. Built right? around him. They just played him on the left or as a 10. And well, they, they just passed him the to... ball whenever they were in the final third. Like, that was the thing, right? Yeah, and then, like, against Southampton last game, uh, Southampton won, they had Al Ghazi playing on the left wing. Mm. It probably would have been Grealish if had he been there and he played sort of, rather than a 4-4-2. Four, four, it was kind of a 4-2-3-1 because Buendia is one of the forwards basically in this system with Bailey and El Ghazi next, you know, in the second line. Um, there, this is the thing, like with a couple more, say they won the next two games, they look a lot better off than they are right now, but mm-hmm. they'll still be mid-table and that's where they're going to end up. And it's really hard to, what's Dean Smith really meant to do with it? He, he wants to win all the games he can, like any manager does, but you can't win all of the games because other managers also need to win all the games they want to be able to win. Mm. I realise this makes little sense. <laughs> but there's the thing with like all those teams in the Premier League, I, what what do they want to happen? Unless, you, like, look at the... Look I think they, and the in, Villa, in Villa's uh, uh, case, presumably, is that they want to avoid relegation. I think the fear, the fear, and again, this is why some some people have questioned whether it's a kind of knee jerk decision or not. The fear, of course, is uh, you know going back down to the championship after establishing themselves here last season. Um, that would be detrimental. Well, it was. It, did you read Christian Perslow's statement, Joe? Because he talked about. I mean, it wasn't. He didn't really mention relegation. I mean, that's probably implied. But he talked about we haven't made the forward progress or something something similar. I'm paraphrasing. Sure. And it was sort of that was the bit at which I I lost a little bit of sympathy because I thought well. You sold your best player, um, about £60 million worth of player that you brought in hasn't really been available. I really like Leon Bailey. I think Buendia is a good player, but these are um, Buendia played last season in the Championship, has played in the Premier League before, but there's a little bit of a, a jump up to accommodate, to deal with. Bailey, uh, Bailey is notoriously up and down, really talented guy, um, super gifted, but hot has cold. always been... Well, also, he's had physical issues, so you haven't really had the opportunity to work him into the side. So you've lost your best player and the club have tried to replace him by committee, 
but two members of that committee haven't really been available and now Danny Ings isn't available either because yeah. he's injured too and I I feel like I always think that in this situation when you've when you've got a little bit of credit in the bank as a manager when you've got a promotion under your belt when you've got a Premier League survival season and then a jump up into mid-table as last season significant progress I think you're at the opportunity to reset somehow you're you're at the opportunity to go through a hard winter to look at what you have and to start using the tools that you've been given um but that just doesn't happen by november and especially not if you don't have those players available every week and it's just it's a little bit difficult to take and i yeah it's it's i, I think this is all going to be shaped by whoever replaces him presumably um they um they have someone in mind because if you make a change now it's usually with uh, installing someone before the international break begins so you get sure. the full two weeks yeah. of preparation but um yeah odd well let's odd. let's talk about that now uh jj because um you know as as seb said apparently the club will have a, a or are aiming to have a permanent manager in place before the next league game we've heard uh gerard's name mentioned quite a lot we've seen um martinez has been mentioned in various rumors too um what do you think about this i think whoever takes it um, will only be able to finish in mid-table. And the problem with that is that you might end up finishing mid-table by the end of the season just by three points. Is they're, not, they're not separated by many points at the yeah. end of the season, these teams in mid-table. You look at the squad and the, the first team, I mean, the, depending on whoever's manager, like the bench in this game against Southampton is all youth players and Ashley Young. It's, just, it's kids. Sure. The first team, Ollie Watkins is fine. You know, he's not like Danny Ings is a good player. He'd be there. Martinez is a really good goalkeeper. John McGinn's a decent midfielder. The rest of them, it's all right. Uh, as Seb, I think JJ's far too harsh on Aston Villa's squad. But I don't think that they're not, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just not they're not good either. Mm. They're in the middle. I think, I think there's a bit of latent potential. Like I like, um, he said Ollie I, Watkins is fine. I think Ollie Watkins I, I, is good. Well, no, I think, I think Ollie Watkins is a kind of somewhere between a six and a seven out of 10 Premier League player. Like I, I like him, but I, uh, he kind of fluctuates quite wildly. He's not. He's not a player that. He's not a forward that. Um, who Joe doesn't like this. Seb. When you, you when, when you play earlier. against him, you're not worried about Ollie Watkins. You're worried about Grealish. I think to a certain extent, you're worried about Ings. You'd Buendia. worry about Bailey if he was fit. Buendia, yeah. I, I think there's there's talent there. I think it's a pretty decent squad. I think also if you think about where the squad was when they came up and the players they added to that initially and where it is now, I think that's quite significant progress. Like I remember um, the big Belgian forward, Wesley, uh, they signed when they came back in the Premier League. And now you think, well, we, you've got Ings, Watkins, Troy can play in sort of central attacking areas. I know he's not really um, a centre forward, but you, know, you have these players that can that offer a wide variety of attacking options. You've got Emmanuel so Martinez goal. You've got Tyrone Mings, Mings is, a, is, a, is a good centre-back. Well, I feel, I feel Mings. Mings, Mings, is, Mings hasn't played very well. Like, he's one of the... Um, I'm he's not saying his these... form is great, but, he, he, but he's a good... No, no, player. I know. I, I just mean in the Plus, sense that it's one of the reasons permanent. why they are where they are is because he's another one of these England, England players who's, who has come out of the European Championship and sure. has dipped. Yeah, but like um, Harry Maguire's dipped and you wouldn't yeah. catch JJ saying he was just fine. Wouldn't you? I don't know, maybe you would. <laughs> maybe you would. Anyway, we haven't got time for this. We'll talk more about Villa when uh, <laughs> when they do appoint the a new manager next week. Casper we Hulman <laughs> also up there in the odds as well. John Terry appears to be high in the odds, although he seems to have just joined Twitter and be fascinated with NFTs. So that's quite funny. Um, good luck, John. That's, that's going to go well, isn't it? Yes, indeed it is. Yeah. Indeed it is. Uh, Daniel Farker. Oh, what a shame. Daniel Farker uh, lost his job, of course, uh, after a 2-1 victory over Brentford uh, in, in a game in which Nor Norwich kind of finally showing the results from some of their recent promise, which has been there. Uh, you know, of course, he's been in the job for four and a half years and his football Seb won Norwich promotion twice and last year a huge points tally in the championship. Um, seems a kind of stark contrast with the performances in the Premier League as we've uh, as we've spoken about already. His, uh, his statement uh, upon re receiving the news after that Brentford game that he was leaving was very sweet, wasn't it? Again, similarly to the situation with Dean Smith, this is a coach that will be missed, um, that, you know, most fans weren't delighted to see go, um, that the club, you know, very difficult position for the club to be in, I think. Um, bit of a sad one. Really sad one. I watched their game against Brentford and they were pretty good. They, mm. 
I think with the exception of a couple of the truly elite teams in the division, they did a better job of handling Brentford than, um, you know, Brentford's approach, which is to load the box and, you know, to to get the heavy guns out and put the ball, you know, in awkward positions. Norwich dealt with it brilliantly. Yeah. They also um, dealt like a little bit of composure when they were holding on to the lead. They clearly got a little bit of afraid, thinking, God, we, we might win. Mm. And uh, any time they tried to work the ball out of their own zones, they would just surrender it in... Um, when they're in half, it was difficult to watch because it happened four or five times in a row. Yeah. And you just thought, that's a thing to build on. Because at the time, they won that game and they went above Newcastle, hilariously. And then a couple of hours later, Daniel Fark has gone. And it's, mm. I get it. I get it. It just... Um, Can I say, I think um, for all of the Have you spoken to Uncle Damien? I have spoken to happened. Uncle Damien, yeah. He, yeah. He, you know, he understands it. He, he, he similar, Similarly to the position we've taken here already, he understands it. It's a sad thing. But I want to say to the people on Twitter who appear to think, oh, you lose 10 Premier League games, whatever, of course, I like, can't believe anyone would think this is a weird decision. It's much more complicated than that. Those people obviously have no f***ing idea what they're talking about. Daniel Fucker won 97 points in the championship last season. Not only that, not only championship results, but also the number of young players that that coach has brought through at Norwich. Exciting, exciting young players. Uh, either have come through the academy or young acquisitions come in. Players like, um, you know, not so young anymore, but Emi, Emi Buendia, for example, was uh, bought by Daniel Fucker. Todd Cantwell, who's sort of disappeared as, uh, you know, recently, but also players like Jamal Lewis and a few others who've moved on. Um, Max Aaron, Ben Godfrey as well. Like what, what he's done at that uh, club is super, super impressive. And obviously, as we said before, the stark contrast of being able to achieve those results in the championship and not do that in the Premier League, it, it makes it understandable as to why the decision has been taken. Hey, um, but the idea that James it's straightforward this, it's just, it's just well. not straightforward at all. And um, th those people really annoy me. I hate them, JJ. I hate them. Well, that's nice. I guess yeah. one of the things that they could say was perhaps part of Farker's downfall was his uh, unwillingness to adapt and be more pragmatic with the team. He plays the way that he wants to play, sure. which I actually really admire, and I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah, and He's, other teams have come up and done that and been successful. Yeah, and then and Norwich have had success playing in that way over the past few years, and this is the way yeah. they're they're built now. So whoever comes in, you think probably has to follow the same sort of line of thinking, but then why not just keep Farker, who's clearly very talented coach, sure. done really well with him. So then you bring in someone, say you go down like the, not Sam Allardyce, but that sort of route mm -hmm. with someone who's more defensive and will happily sit back and try and grind out a point till the 75th minute when you can open up a little bit. Yeah. That may be, might be what they do, but do they have, I don't know if they have the players for that even. I don't think that will be the case either. I was, um, Reading a little bit about it before, I'm looking, uh, trying, trying to find quickly the odds. There is, um, uh, Frank Lampard is someone, Seb, who's been uh, <laughs> discussed as it related to this job. But also, I'm trying to find the the, 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 player, the manager's name. I can't remember his name. You talk about Frank Lampard first, and then I'll play back. I saw uh, them being connected this morning with the, um, the, the manager of the Norwegian side that beat Roma 6-1. Uh, yes, Bodo. Bodo, that's um, that is the guy. Oh, yes, it, it is uh, Knutson. Yeah, that's the one, Joe. And I think what's important is we, we kind of what you've already described, the, the number of players that have come through or been developed or been flipped for profit by Norwich. James is, Madison, of course, as James well. James Madison I as well spent time. Him. Really yeah. developed Aberdeen, though, if you really well, were being specific. But, you know, he had his launching pad at Norwich. But he really made so. a name for himself, and he said himself that mm. he really was made a player at Aberdeen, so... Just advising any young uh, potential superstar Premier League players listening to this podcast, of which I assume there are many. Come make to sure Aberdeen. You come to Aberdeen, please. <laughs> Soon. Please. Love, JJ. Yeah. And regards. Also, JJ. JJ. Yeah. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> no. Uh, yes. Well, anyway. Goodbye to Daniel Farker. I liked him. I like him still. Uh, we'll be back after this break. Mmm, we're back. Everton nil. Nil Tottenham. Oh, what a game. But Antonio Conte said, according to the evening standard, Conte was 90 minutes late to his press conference on Friday because the team was still training. Mm? That was the day after a game as well. You're not supposed to do that, or at least you don't do that often. He's working those boys hard, Seb. Did you see that in the game there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you saw the effect with his, just his being there, because the level of intensity was much, much higher. Um, long way to go, because I think that um, 
I mean, the creative issues are still not right. There's no real passing from central midfield either. There's no sort of, um, there's no real creativity. But it was stubborn because that was a nasty game. That was a nutritional, hostile atmosphere. Mm. Um, it's quite a niggly 90 minutes. Um, Might have been um, a red card before Mason Holgate went, eventually went for that tackle on uh, Pierre Hoiberg. But it's it's good because I think um, I think looking back, one of the things we've been missing at Spurs for quite a few years is that level of competitive tension. Because a, like a competitive Premier League game, um, it has a, a certain feel to it. it. Has a tension. Has a um, there's a nervousness and a kind of knife edge aspect to yes. it. Which and I energy. think if you play, yeah, energy. But I think if Tottenham had played that match last weekend or the weekend before, they lose because eventually, mm. just by sheer force of will, somehow something goes wrong. Somebody makes a mistake. Um, somebody lets everybody down by not tracking somebody that kind of thing but when you have a new manager and I don't know whether this is about Conte or simply the change of manager and the big name but those things were missing and Spurs held on so what Um, what you're saying there is that Antonio Conte already worth one point yeah I'd say so I'd chalk that point up to him it was it was good I like that um I like his honesty I like that he recognizes that he spoke a little bit um just after he got appointed about you know Tottenham as an, an off the field club um, top class, you know, lovely stadium, great training facilities, all that kind of stuff. Big, big sort of commercial ambitions, but they're behind um, on the pitch, and I think that would chime with what most fans not only feel but have been frustrated by over the past yeah. couple of years. It's a pretty, str- sort of, pretty straightforward one, isn't yeah. it? Just absolutely <laughs> buried Nuno as well. Basically, going uh, this, whoever was in before, yeah. useless. That is, I mean, I don't, like I don't know if I read it that way. I, I just felt as if it was a good, solid diagnosis of what a lot of fans feel. Like it's become, sure. for a long time for the club, it's been really, really important to expand relationships with the NFL or to finish the stadium mm. or to to have um, that funny brewery in the stadium where the cups fill up from below, that stuff. And you just think, yeah, that's all fine, but buy a centre-half too. Or, you know, yeah. we haven't got a midfielder who can pass the ball 20 yards reliably. So that's also important. Sure. And Conte tallied with the idea that he's quite, he's not fearful of the executives. He doesn't mind pointing a finger internally and saying, right, well, you know, I need this and I need this and I need this. And and it it was good. It was kind of soothing. It was a little bit aggressive, but in a good way. Yeah. Good aggression. Well, Mm -hmm. that anyway begins the process of us here beginning to discuss things that we don't have time to talk about and we will talk about next week, uh, including Chelsea 1. 1 Burnley, we won't talk about the game, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, Chelsea next week. Uh, Odd game, this one, in which uh, Chelsea punished, of course, but not finishing those chances. Um, And, you know, injuries, of course there are injuries. But Ross Barkley, Seb, Ross Barkley there, Thomas Tuchel, apparently impressed with Barkley's determination and desire for a future at Chelsea. It was his first uh, Premier League start of the season uh, for them in this fixture. He played the game. Ross Barkley. Yeah, it's just such a strange sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. He's not going to have a future at Chelsea because there's just too many players ahead of him. Sure. Um, he was right in this game, though, wasn't he? He did fine. He did fine. Uh, but he, it felt, felt like he was selected because um, Thomas Tuchel kind of thought that he would, Bernie would roll over at Stamford Bridge and it sure. would be a, a good way of, you know, mm. keeping players fresh after a Champions League week. Fair no, enough. No, no, no. But no, no, no. Bernie is stubborn. And they have a little bit of a, a funny record at Stamford Bridge, too. Yes, um, yes. Well, if you look into it, it's not what you'd expect. It's done pretty well. No, if you look into it, it's funny. Yeah. You'll learn. It's quite funny. That's what you you're will. saying. Yes. Well, anyway, we'll talk about Chelsea and, and perhaps Burnley as well next week. Also, teams we'll talk about next week. Arsenal won nil Watford. Uh, you know, again, no time for it now. But here's a few fun facts that came out of the weekend. You ready for some fun facts here, JJ? I love fun facts. Good. I'll expect a reaction to each of these facts. Hmm? Mm. <coughs> fun fact number one. This was Arteta's 100th game in charge in all competitions. <coughs> Wait for me to finish the facts before you make your noise. Let's try that one more time. This was Arteta's 100th game in charge in all competitions. <laughs> okay, that's a good reaction. Here's another one. Emil Smith-Rowe becomes the fourth Arsenal player ever to score three games in a row aged 21 or under. <laughs> yes, the other players were Anelka, Reyes and Fabregas. That's good. Yeah. And the final one, Ben Foster became the oldest goalkeeper to save a penalty in the Premier League. <laughs> it's the same reaction as the second one. I feel similarly about it. Yeah? Yeah. What? How could you describe that feeling in words? Because uh, it sounds like can you, just, you are aroused. That's the thing. It sounds like it's you. Not. No. It's, um, 
gargling. Like the sound of if you were a frog and you saw your young developed from tadpoles into smaller frogs <laughs> bouncing off over the lily pads into the distance, into the forest to become their own frogs. <laughs> Crystal Palace 2, nil wolves. Again, another example of a team. It's an international break next week and who cares about the international football? Not me. So we'll be talking about Crystal Palace next week for sure because they extended their unbeaten run to six games, Seb, in the league. Sure did. Also, um, do you remember the reaction to Patrick Vieira about a month in? No. When there were some slightly mischievous reports about, oh, you know, Palace are really looking at replacements. Nonsense, oh, of course. It yeah. was just kind of people making trouble. But um, compare this sort of the success of this cultural reset so far with the Frank de Boer project. Sure. Because it's a difficult thing to do to go from Hodgson and uh, everything entailed with that style of management to being forward thinking and um, for picking teams. Mm. Frank yeah, but was, I was thinking that when you said the Frank de Boer project, it made it sound like a kind of, you know, an art house thing. Yeah. It'd be like yeah, post, yeah. post something. Sure. Yeah. Quite angular. Post truth. At a drive in type thing. Yeah. Good band. Anyway, also Javi is the new Barcelona coach. So maybe we'll talk about that when we've seen him actually play. A few He's being presented there. as we speak. Um, you wrote down here, uh, Red Bull Leipzig uh, 2, 1 Borussia Dortmund, of course. Yeah, I feel like I talked about this quite a lot in the live stream, so I shall spare the podcast audience a repeat, but well done, Christopher and Cuckoo. Good yeah. player. Good, good, good player. Good player. I saw his little couple of pirouettes there in the box. Very exciting yeah. pirouettes. Yeah. yeah. Have we talked about Seb's live streams and how he does them every Sunday now on the pod? No, no, I think we mentioned it last week, did we? Why don't you we tell us, that, Well, if You're you, the only one here not involved. You, you should talk about it. Yeah, if you have eyes and ears and like the football, yeah. Seb is started doing a very entertaining live stream every Sunday. It's mm. at 10 p.m. Um, British time. time. Yeah. Yes. British time, yeah. GMT. Yes, uh, 10 p.m. on Sundays on Tifo IRL. Yeah. And I thoroughly recommend you go and watch it because he's full of information. It's good fun. Seb starts by talking about two things of his own choosing, and then he takes questions from the audience. You could join one of the 800 that enjoyed Seb last night. It's a lot. It is a lot, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And you also, if you want, you can just see him in his attic there. Anyway, on Javi, just before we finish, um, you know, one thing I should tell you about is that the Athletics football podcast last week did a great episode all about Javi's inevitable return to Barcelona. With Andy Mitten. <laughs> exactly the right reaction there. So you can check that out wherever you can find your podcasts. But for now, uh, that's all from us, from uh, Herr Stafford Bloor. Uh, uh, gut, guten Nacht. Auf Wiedersehen. Yes. And uh, JJ Bull. Good night. Yes. Yes. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. And of course, uh, thanks as usual to producers Don and Adonis. And we will be back next week with more of the same. 